I welcome you uh, all, uh, the speaker, uh, Dr. G. L. Shiva Kumar Babu from IIC Bangalore. He is a professor of geotechnical engineering department of civil engineering. And all the panelists, Mr. R. K. Pandey, Mr. Rajiv Ahuja, Dr. Rajnakar Mahajan, Dr. Jimmy Thomas, Mr. Tanu Mozikari, and all the participants. Uh, today's webinar is on failure of reinforced soil walls, lessons and remedies. As we know, uh, reinforced soil walls are extensively being used in infrastructure projects, and there are several uh, collapses also there. So today is the right time. Uh, we will, in the webinar, we will try to understand the failure mechanisms, causes, and remedies of reinforcement soil wall failures. I'm sure it will be very interesting uh, webinar. And this webinar will be moderated by uh, Mr. Abu Kodomik. Uh, I understand uh, I'm seeing and 282 participants have joined and I think around 1,000 have registered. So I'm sure many more will join. And uh, many of you may not be the member of IES Recti. For those who are not the member of IES Recti, I just want to inform that IES Recti, that is Indian Association of Structural Engineers, is a national apex body of structural engineers in India. And we have members from all over India. They are all eminent structural engineers. And anybody can become the member. Uh, you can download the form from website and you can become the member if you satisfy your eligible as per the eligibility criteria. So, uh, I request all of you to become the member of IES Recti if you are not. And uh, let me introduce Mr. Alok Komik. Alok Komik is an eminent bridge engineer. He is the past president of uh, Indian Association of Structural Engineers. He is also international professional engineers, and he is a fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineers. So now I request Alok Homing to start the event and hello. I think you are muted. You are muted, Alok. Alok, you are okay. muted. Okay, am I audible now? Yes, you can start. Great, now. great. So thank you, uh, Mr. President, and good afternoon, friends. Uh, welcome you all to this uh, webinar, which is uh, on a very important topic, that is the failure of uh, reinforced soil walls, lessons and remedies. Uh, as you all know, you know, this topic is extremely important uh, and very, very topical in the present scenario. Uh, we have witnessed number of failures of reinforced soil walls in the recent past. And uh, this entire civil engineering fraternity is really concerned. Uh, in many WhatsApp groups uh, or technical WhatsApp groups, we have seen this concern by our colleagues and friends. And uh, such failures are denting our image in the society as civil engineers. Uh, today, we, we have gathered here, we have a battery of experts on the subject, and we will try to get answers to many of the questions that comes to our mind uh, related to RE wall, uh, RS wall, reinforced soil wall, uh, and their failures. Uh, why is it that we are witnessing such series of frequent failures in India? Is it the error of conception? Or is it the error of execution? Or is it the error of intent? Maybe it is a combination of all these three. Uh, what are the remedies? What are the solutions? And how do we... Uh, mitigate these uh, risks that we are having and how can we overcome these problems? These are questions I think we will try to find answers today. We are very fortunate to have with us uh, an eminent speaker who will share his knowledge, his wisdom and his experience with us. I have great pleasure in introducing our speaker of the day, uh, Professor Shiva Kumar Babu, who is a professor in geotechnical division of Indian Institution of Science, Bangalore. And I welcome you, sir. I also uh, have great pleasure to welcome five eminent panelists for this session. 
uh, they uh, together represents the entire spectrum of you know engineering fraternity starting from the client to the consultant the manufacturer and the uh, and the geotechnical consultant they will share uh, also with their experience and their wisdom with us after the uh, after the uh, uh, presentation by professor babu we are very fortunate to have uh, mr r k pande with us who is a member projects nhai and a very prominent member uh, involved in guiding all the nhai projects we have with us also mr rajiv ahuja a structural engineering consultant who has more than 40 years of hands on experience in design and he is dealing with uh, these kind of designs day in and day out as a as a member of uh, structural consultant we have dr jimmy thomas with us an eminent geotechnical expert deeply involved in reinforced soil wall designs i uh, distinctly remember in 2013 he was the guest editor for a journal which is uh, where i am the editor that is uh, uh, indian national group of iabsc journal bridge and structural engineer where a particular issue was dedicated to reinforced soil wall and he was the guest editor we also have uh, dr uh, ratnakar mahajan from makaferi another specialist engineer involved in conceptualization and detailed design from the manufacturer side uh, and also we have mr atanu adhikari from reinforced earth a specialist designer to the core and i know he is involved in reinforced soil wall design for last two decades at least so we will have the presentation first by professor uh, babu which uh, may last for about an hour we will then uh, take views from our uh, panelists on the subject and this will be followed by q and a session we hope to conclude uh, this session by 6 pm or maybe 6:15 at best all participants uh, are requested to kindly put their questions in q and a box and not in chat box in case we do not get enough time to address to, to all questions after the panel discussion then maybe uh, we will send response later and panelists may respond to the query from the q and a if they wish to during the presentation or discussion with this uh, opening remarks i would like to now uh, hand over this platform to our speaker professor shiva kumar babu but before i do that i have the privilege to uh, introduce him professor shiva kumar babu completed his phd in geotechnical engineering in 1991 from the indian institute uh, of science bangalore after obtaining master's degree in soil mechanics and foundation engineering in 1987 from anna university madras and btech in civil engineering degree in 1983 from shri venkateshwara university tirupati he worked as humboldt fellow in germany during june 1999 to july 2000 and as visiting scholar pardew university uh, in usa during uh, 95 96 He served as the president of Indian Geotechnical Society during 2017 to 2020, and is currently the chairman of International Technical Committee, that is TC302, on Forensic Geotechnical Engineering of International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. He is a fellow of American Society of Civil Engineers, and also served as governor uh, ASC Region 10. during 2014 to 2020 he guided 23 research degrees that is 18 phd's and 5 uh, masters he wrote a book on soil reinforcement and geosynthetics edited 8 books and proceedings and has several publications to his credit international and national journals around 175 international and national conference more than 151 and total over 325 He received several awards, such as John Booker Award from uh, IAC MAG, Humboldt Fellowship from Germany, DST Boycast Fellowship, and a few awards for the best papers from Indian Geotechnical Society and American Society of Civil Engineers. With this brief introduction, let me request Professor Shiva Kumar Babu to kindly take the floor. All participants are requested to put their questions. Again, I once again uh, repeat. 
kindly put it in q and a box and not in chat box so that we are able to address all the questions and uh, we respond to them uh, over to you professor babu kindly share your screen uh, thank you dr uh, alok uh, for a very uh, nice introduction and uh, giving me an opportunity am i audible yes yes very yeah, much thank you so much and uh, it has been a great pleasure uh, to talk about a very very important topic uh, lessons from the failure of uh, reinforced soil walls and the way forward i should like to acknowledge uh, first my alok for giving me this uh, topic which is very challenging and uh, uh, during this course of about a month i had uh, discussions with many of our friends uh, they are from arival uh, construction they are involved in arival construction they have been a lot of uh, companies dealing with this and a lot of experts and engineers so i would like to acknowledge them uh, so i just want to uh, talk about the technique first so the we know that the reinforced soil technique uh, since its introduction by uh, you know by henry vidal has has been very useful and it has very successful in uh, you know variety of uh, constructions and um, the we have different types of facing panels uh, such as uh, you know concrete panels modular box gabions and geosynthetic products and um, there are but then you know this uh, even the heights are also unprecedented but then at the same time we had couple of failures uh, so what exactly is happening is what we'd like to see and uh, okay so uh, we we know that uh, you know when you have ori walls we have uh, you know we are, it has led to a lot of nice constructions you know you can see a, uh, one here you can see with uh, blocks here and then you have with gabions here and one thing that we need to realize is that you know you have uh, three elements here one is a you know rain soil soil itself you know the actually the main thing here is a soil which is the reinforced soil as well as you have a retained soil and you have a facing element and uh, you know we should re realize that the soil here is a structural backfill uh, it has certain uh, properties and at the same time we have been seeing a lot of failures uh, a lot of examples one can give uh, here you have one failure here you have another failure here you have another failure in form of deformations uh, just last week somebody sent me this i mean i mean we see a lot of uh, photos like this in uh, wax up and in circulation but what exactly are the reasons actually i was just going through the literature and then you know Uh, Bob Corner, who is the author of uh, a classical uh, book on geosynthetics, in, he talks about failures in our walls, particularly on geosynthetic uh, material using geosynthetic material. He thinks that he says that the problem is quite complex, but the estimate of this uh, failures is about one in you know thousand, which is two to even it's a little higher, which is a big number. Uh, because uh, there, there, particularly in North America, he talks about and then. Uh, the issue is that i i should tell you that there is a some sort of failure criteria in engineering uh, particularly developed by mit group that one in 10000 is accepted in failures but not in one in 1000 you know something like that so uh, and then when he talks about the number of failures he says that uh, when he just had a database of about 300 failures and 94 are because of the excessive deformation and uh, 69% of them are collapsed so this is again uh, points to the important uh, fact that yeah so we should look at stability issues and uh, when you have reinforcement we should look at internal stability and external stability and internal stability we look at um, tensile over stress i mean either because of the uh, you know the spacing and then the pull out you know the, then the facing connections uh, we also look at external stability like sliding bearing capacity and other uh, sliding and overturning and all of this this is a routine thing that we do yeah so he also says that you know when you have this uh, different types of failures he just tries to categorize that into different categories that you know you can talk about internal stability particularly with reference to the wall fill where you have low soil friction low interface friction angle the spacing even the length could be a little shorter and even the geosynthetic orientation in fact i'll give an example a couple of case studies there internal water itself like the um, pro the water that is such a problematic thing in most of the geotechnical constructions like uh, drainage pipe leakage catch basin leakage and even any of the pipes leakages patched water saturated backfill external instability it can be very high you know because of the surcharge or low shear strength burning capacity 
uh, steep exit angle, seismic forces, external water, particularly if you don't control it properly, but the, uh, the surface drainage, it can lead to a lot of problems like tension cracks. I will give some case studies on that. Retained uh, seepage, surface infiltration, uh, some of these things are quite complex. So, you know, soil erosion at the toe, you know, we have seen the inward, there were uh, the slopes are not maintained at the base properly, which lead to a lot of collection. So uh, when, uh, you know, Alok was asking, uh, let us have a uh, discussion on this, then I just thought that there is a need to understand and come up with some specific plans to reduce this number in India and understand it better. Then I just circulated uh, some mails with these three questions that, what are the typical reasons for failure of the reinforced soil structures that you or your organization has hand hand handled? What can be done to reduce the number of failures in India in terms of the policy at the client at, li at the client level, designer or contractor, whatever level you want? And sometimes the question always is that whether the IRC provisions or whatever the uh, provisions that we have in India are adequate or not, or do you want to have any clarity or uh, modifications? So in general, the understanding is that, yes, there are some lack of understanding of uh, design principles and quality control because the design is it's a very, uh, very intricate design. And then quality control is another important point. And poor connection design, in, we have seen that even in, I feel from Corner's lecture that the, the lot of uh, failures of uh, uh, connection are there. And then poor backfill quality, inadequate drainage, and uh, you know, inadequate quality control and communication gap between engineers, contractors, and material suppliers. So if they are there, is there, an, is there a way that we can come up with some plan? Can we have a guidance document like uh, trying to talk about best practices in India? This is what we'd like to see. So I would like to just talk about the uh, you know principles of reinforced soil, factors affecting the behavior of soil. You know this is a uh, then case studies of failure and analysis and discussion way forward and conclusions something. So we always say that you know why should we see so many failures? Can we have some prevention? We also now realize that like an you know, appropriate uh, vaccination, appropriate code behavior, right? So in the sense that can we do proper quality control or remediation? I mean, we should not even think of remediation, but let us look at prevention itself is a point that we should see. Uh, to the Towards that, I just want to talk about uh, uh, this and uh, the way that the, uh, the retaining systems have evolved, we know that historically that we had cantilever, retaining walls, gravity walls, and uh, basic excavations and all of that. But the reinforced soil technique is of recent origin, maybe about 30 to 40 years. And uh, we are trying to internally uh, reinforce the soil such that you have only a facing and uh, you know a simple structural design is involved, but it really is more on the soil properties. That's one thing. Uh, uh, this is actually, you know, when you look at a BS code, which there's so many codes now on uh, British code. If you look at the, it's, it's a reinforced soil is a, you know, it's essentially a general term, which, uh, you, which talks about, I mean, which is actually refers to the use of uh, a soil, either placed or in situ, it can be even soil nailing or placed in a reinforced soil in which the tensile forces or tensile reinforcements act through the interface friction. This is something that is very, not, not, not many new. Uh, it's uh, Henry Vidal who discovered this. So either inter interface friction, bearing or other means to improve stability. That's what it says. And um, so we have the reinforcing elements. You have the facing elements. You have the backfill soils and you have some optional options here. And this is one of the first uh, principles that they said, if you have a soil, try to apply some load, uh, but there will be a vertical deformation. There'll be a horizontal deformation. Uh, but then if you put reinforcement, what happens is that the, the, the reinforcement element takes care of that. So because of the friction, interface friction that gets developed between the uh, soil and the reinforcement, and that, that gives some sort of pseudo confining pressure. So it's like this, that, and then the soil will be like, you know, the, uh, this is a failure state. And then, you know, soil will not, the moment you put the reinforcement, you apply load, it's a force. In the, in the reinforcement that gets developed, as long as the reinforcement is, um, the force is fine within its allowable limit and the uh, friction is there, you know, which doesn't really cause any slip, you're okay with that. So that is a very nice principle. And people were trying to characterize what is the pseudo confining pressure that you get because of the reinforcement. And uh, that's a lot of examples are there. 
and uh, better explanation was also given by you know say for example if you take any reinforced so soil slope or a retaining wall if there is a failure surface you put a reinforcement somewhere here then there is some uh, you know the when you put a reinforcement it, they interact so when you interact with that what happens is that um, there is a lot of advantage that's what is uh, explained most of the time if you normally you know we in the soil is poor in shear so we the moment you apply load it tends to shear but if you want to if you put a reinforcement it doesn't shear so why it doesn't shear is because of the friction that gets developed and what is the advantage like the resisting force drastically improves uh, as a function of the vertical load applied and as well as this uh, friction angle of the soil and the reinforcement force developed so this is a simple expression the difference between the um, and the infus soil and the reinforced soil the shear resistance enormously is increased and it is a function of all of these three factors like uh, one thing he can see that the orientation and it in which it is placed you know the uh, the orientation of the reinforcement and also so that way uh, friction angle the best part is that you can see that if the friction angle is if the orientation is in the, in the range of 30 to 60 degrees you will have the best benefit you know the increase in strength of the soil itself it's very good and in, in most of the, our civil engineering constructions, we have this orientation. The moment you put this, uh, like, like in a, whether it is in a slope or uh, even in a bearing capacity problem, the slope, the angle of uh, reinforcement, we always place it horizontally because we do construction in that manner. So you just instead of uh, you know instead of normal uh, and after compaction, you put a geogrid or a reinforcement element, and that will take care of it. That's what. So it's, it shows enormous improvement in bearing capacity, stability, and everything. So very important factor would be that when you're trying to use um, different types of reinforcing elements, like say whether it's flexible or rigid, like flexible is geocentric material and the uh, rigid like or the stiff or you know, the steel reinforcement, um, there is a stress strain response that they have, like we all know in uh, concrete and steel, we know that. Uh, but when you're trying to, uh, talk, to uh, talk about reinforced soil, what happens, there is a you have uh, you know soil also there so they interact as i said the friction gets developed and there is a force in the reinforcement that force in the reinforcement which is actually contributing to the strength of the reinforced soil itself like it's it is very important for all the people to understand that the reinforcement is a function of the type of soil the density like if the density is very good if the density is very good then it needs small strains less strains to cause um, that uh, level of uh, force, like you can see that the stress in the reinforcement is quite high at a very low strain level. Whereas in a loose sand, you know, you, it takes a little more strong strain levels, a little higher. So it may yield a bit, maybe uh, more, a few mm more, but uh, it loose also is loses there, but it can lead to a lot of problems, you know, if it is loose. So this is what you call it as a strain compatibility, like, you know, because the uh, some forces uh, developed in the reinforcement because there is a strain, because soil and um, the reinforcement, they get uh, rubbed against each other. So the soil stiffness is very important. You know, if it is very stiff, like that, why we want very good compaction is that it will have a very good stiffness. Uh, so the soil state compact is excellent. Soil type, maybe dense, or, you know, the sandy material or something, they're much better. And so that's why you call it a soil state. And not only that, uh, when, uh, when there is a, normally what happens in uh, they they have this uh, dense materials have a tendency to dilate so when they have a tendency for volume increase it, there is a reinforcement contracting contracting it and the forces in the reinforcement will become much higher so the moment it's compact and even if there is some water content all of that is there the effectiveness is really excellent uh, another point that i just wanted to highlight would be that uh, the professor jones he wrote a very nice book on uh, factors affecting the reinforced soil. See, the principles are excellent, but when you construct, what are the problems? What are the issues we should understand? This uh, he just, I think, uh, after this uh, British code came and all that, I think it was also partly responsible. It was a very interesting table that uh, what are the factors affecting? It can be right from reinforcement, reinforcement distribution, soil, soil state, and construction. So he gives all of this soil reinforcement. We know all of them now, geogrid companies know, steel people know, everything is fine. Uh, so we have different types like forms, surface properties, dimensions, and strength and stiffness. We all know them. Uh, so that's why we have different level types of products and all of that. Even the reinforcement uh, positions, like how do you locate, what should be spacing, orientation, by and large, 
everybody everything is understood but you know even the soil when it comes to backfill soil what should be the particle size the code says uh, grading mineral content index properties so even they specify the index properties but what is causing uh, the problem is this in the specifications like you know uh, since there is a, some clay content and all of that we may have to since the backfill materials are not there you may end up going for little higher uh, clay content or something then soil state that's why I just flagged off in a red mark density density is another problem that um, you know it's very important like as i just mentioned if the compaction is good then density are good then the state of stress you know the state of stress like it can be you know uh, the uh, in what level of uh, stresses are in that and to what extent the dilation can be caused or compression can be caused that could be another important even the degree of saturation initially we compact the samples but at the same time you know the uh, so the degree of saturation may be 90% or 85 but the moment there is inundation and all of that and rainfall comes the degree of saturation also plays a role actually a lot of things can be added in this table and when it comes to construction which is i mean then the compaction as i said is very important and then the construction systems you know the way that we have been working uh, there are so many construction systems in the indian market uh, you know in fact uh, um, sri rk pandey ji was mentioning that there are hundreds of people in the market nowadays we are not sure who is reliable you know it's a very big a big statement uh, there are some failures as usual you can have you know you can see one some failure here and um, so it is essentially people say it's a connection failure that's what it says you know but then uh, so when you are looking at uh, failures what you should do is that you know this is in uh, some terms of the forensic analysis that you should really characterize the distress that you have then you know test diagnostic test whatever test you can do the collection of site information particularly you know uh, the uh, samples geographic samples at the site you know whatever the samples that are used and also the uh, you know uh, one more thing was the site specific information that the rainfall rainfall and all of that because i know i have seen many of the sites you will not have any information on this in fact site specific information is not available if you want to understand anything then you know then you try to come up with what is the most probable hypothesis and uh, check with the original design and then try to back analyze using a lot of conventional methods but conventional methods is what is given in courts and any other practices but they may not give you complete picture because it's a deformation most of the things you know a uh, lot of uh, movements are there and uh, the conventional methods of uh, uh, calculations may not give so you may have to use uh, a numerical analysis then suggestions you can do that that i'll give a lot of examples on this so in this small example what i just want uh, saw was that there are four days of continuous rainfall uh, which will which led to the damage in the reinforcement uh, at work and damage near abutment and misalignment of panels and sand flow was noticed and all of that and there were stressing of the connection and then there is a break that that could happen and then when you look at the stem parameters they are excellent and the permeability was also very good the permeability of geotextile material was also fine and but what happened was that there are four days of rainfall you know continuous rainfall when you have you know you have a lot of seepage pressures that are induced and then they act on the um, you know the facing and all of that and uh, you know you have not designed the connection and all of that for the seepage pressure so it could have led to the distress whatever we saw and even there was always a discussion on it you try to place different types of geo grids as to you know say you know as a, because the, uh, the variation of uh, uh, stresses are there in the in the height of the, along the height of the reinforcement uh, reinforced wall so uh, if you have too much differences in uh, stiffness or uh, this thing uh, as i said strain compatibility i was telling the strain strains required will be somewhat different if the materials are too much different so there could be small marginal movements but of course in this case it's more more of a rain and uh, so rainfall effects during the process of construction need to be prevented that's what is the lesson that we have learned from this was that maybe proper precautions during monsoon maybe whether the uh contractor and the agencies have or did we have we have do we have any of the uh, uh things that we need to for the site specific at impact say performance of the reinforced soil in terms of the placement water content wash i mean we have seen that and it impacts you know soil uh, comes out of the facing elements and all that and there is a need to collect data and analyze rainfall effects on the effects of poor pressure and development of reinforcement force we have a lot of uh, guidelines on you know you have federal highway ncmr and bs codes and all of that but they are not completely giving uh, information on this and um, uh, i will show you on in failures how they have become very important and connection loads what happens on the drainage analysis there, there is not much information on this 
and uh, see we are designing the rain are the walls for one in the 100 years or 120 years but are we doing and then even we try to uh, evaluate the design parameters corresponding to 120 years but we have not done anything about drainage filtration and all of that can we say that the filter filters work for 100 years or whatever it's not easy so then the associated effects are somewhat complicated this is one thing so this is a small example that i want to share with you that uh, this is a 26 uh, meter high wall that failed very recently in uh, uh, taiwan and um, you know the thing is the, the way that the, it is a very nice work that they you know big lot of rainfalls that they came and they exerted a lot of pressures it's a, a it's a well made structure but then you know the typhoons came and then it is resulted in a failure here and you can see that they have, they have developed the factor of safety versus the rainfall is given the variation of factor of safety versus uh, uh, you know the duration is also given it's always it should be more than one but at, at this point um, the residual strength what it means is that what is this, uh, that also we should really in fact clearly mention in our course that what is that you are trying to do here is it a peak values you should consider is it a residual value of course it is there but depending on what conditions you are understanding is something important you could see here that the residual uh, value it really could uh, predict uh, that the, there is a factor of safety is close to one here but otherwise it's fine there you know so there is a very tricky thing here so this is another case that we were just seeing this also again 3 4 years back uh, it was and what's up I and mean, then we just looked at it and we find that the silt plus clay content was higher than what we specify in irc and of course the lot of uh, quality of the back the construction was also not great and it in, it impacted the connections and leading to distress and all of that and of course we repaired and all of that with uh, driven nails or whatever here what do you learn Le learning is that the inferior connection materials you know you just go to uh, some market and get them and then fix stuff it's not like bolt and do i mean there is no standardized practice of uh, established connection practice here and hence connection design materials needed need, they need to be evaluated the quality of wall fill is also not satisfactory compaction was also a, a big question mark but you know the problem is sometimes it's very difficult to evaluate when you go to the site but if you have proper test records of everything where a, some qualified persons are there let us show the uh, site specific data you can't retrieve them you know i find that it is always very difficult to see some of the data in the site uh, about it at least on compaction it is sometimes you know this connection design is like you know somebody was telling it's a mix and match you know you go to a shop and try to find out what matches that it is not like that it's not a properly proper integrated evaluation system that's a very very uh, important point and um, so this is another case that uh, i just went to a particular site the wall deformation was about 400 mm i just it was shocking to me and you can see that every time the measurements are not very good every time you have measurements like this with uh, plumb and all that and somebody said you do nailing they did nailing you can see how badly it is done and uh, so uh, then when you looked at it actually the, the, the deformations if you try to as i was trying to look at you know why, why it happened then again as i just mentioned this concept of stress strain compatibility you, you know you can see this figure also the stiffness soil stiffness plays an important role like if you don't do compaction the e value will be lower but if you compact it very well with a good density then the compactions the it will have a low low deformations so maybe because we didn't have much time to inspect on the densities and all i have to uh, believe that uh, because of the uh, loose uh, uh, connection i mean uh, the uh, loose filling and all whatever so the uh, the range the type of deformations are quite excessive but uh, they have been they say that they have been constant for a very long time but there are no measurements but there are no strains or distresses on the pavement or oh, it's only that I, we can say that yeah this is perhaps true because maybe at the initial stage like when they compacted the comp uh, the compaction was not satisfactory and maybe there are a lot of deformation that have developed but it has stabilized over time but they're little higher which was something very uh, tricky uh, but then somebody said okay use nailing so whether it is surviving but it is a bit problematic to understand why uh, or what is going to happen so the deformation of the wall was beyond acceptable limits these are the lessons and there are no measurements so there should be some record of measurements and the quality control right from the beginning of the construction and of course you just go to the site and everybody contradicts each other oh and then everybody changes i mean oh it is i think i think over a period of maybe 15 years there are a lot of changes that's what i understand uh, you know it was uh, 
taking. So communication, this is actually, this is a 45 meter high wall. This is not a failure, but you know, I just wanted, it is a very good uh, construction. I should say that 45 meter high wall near uh, one of the important Pelican towns in Andhra. And then you can see that the traffic is going on. And there was, there are a lot of rains again, as usual. We, the rains play havoc and, uh, and then there were some uh, minor deformations. And what happened was that, you know, the, uh, it was uh, filled up completely. The construction was complete. Uh, but then, you know, they have also paving was also done for the road, you know, uh, then the after the construction, the top area of the wall experienced considerable deformations uh, because, you know, you thought that the wall is ready and let us put concreting, let us have uh, op open it for uh, uh, traffic and all of that. But, you know, you have 45 meter of uh, fill, fill material reinforced soil, which is expected to deform with time. So if you start putting concrete or whatever, then it go is going to crack. So there are a lot of problems and large settlements occurred, but then we looked at it and I said, no, you can just measure that. And then we, I think we just, when we measured, they were in the theoretical, I mean, whatever theory says about one to less than one person, there should be some deformations and the deformations were in the same range, you know, which is okay. Like, so, which means that it was all right, but there were some minor uh, things. The other thing, what uh, we learned was that we looked at the, you know, the, um, you have what is called design parameters. So you try to take design parameters always conservatively, but actually after construction, if you do a very good construction, the parameters will be much better. But otherwise, the construct, the you know when you measure the parameters, uh, if they in a bad construction, they'll be very bad. Of course, they don't allow us to measure. So most of the time, that's what happens. So, but here I just forced myself and measured, and the factors of safety are okay. Though the, if you try to look at design parameters, they will not be that that's okay. But then with the actually work, it was very good. In fact, the uh, compaction was also excellent because they couldn't, they wanted to do nailing as usual, but it, they couldn't force the nails. And there were also the 3D effects, like, you know, boundary effect. It, it was like, it was working, it was in a basin. And then they, all these things are well connected to that. Uh, and so there is an excellent 3D effect, which contributed to stability. So we have seen a lot of these uh, 3D effects, like if the construction is bad and if you don't consider uh, boundaries properly, like I have seen about six, six months back, there was an excavation collapse in a multi story building for a multi story building in Bangalore, because you know the, it's quite complex. Similarly, if you're able to come consider the 3D effects properly, you know, then it is, you can assess the stability properly. So there were some minor local deformations because, you know, they did uh, work during, uh, you know, during rain and then that led to some problems, but it was minor. So what I want to tell was appropriate geotechnical interventions, you know, when, see, it can be, it was there here and it was helpful, you know, because uh, there are all others, are, uh, others also quite understandable. So we had a good meeting of structural engineers and geotechnical engineers and understood the case. And there was general agreement that this is fine, though the initial uh, discussions were quite tricky. Uh, but then finally now things are fine. It is what I just wanted to say is that the, the backfill properties, the densities, and they're all very, very important. So appropriate geotechnical in interventions are even right from the beginning, there should be some proper understanding. So uh, that's what I was just mentioning that the, for stability analysis of construction, actual site conditions need to be considered not design parameters, which are conservative. The tests and quality of fills, uh, degree of compaction need to be established in certain spe uh, site specific conditions, actual conditions need to be considered the design analysis of stability later. Monitoring of structures is uh, 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 required and that's what it is. Uh, there is some more uh, literature I was just trying to uh, figure it out. Uh, this is uh, actually, you know, Colin is uh, one of the top guys in the uh, years and he was also responsible for uh, writing a lot of quotes. Um, so there is a typical failure that we also see in India that, you know, you have a segmental retaining wall and again, during rain it failed and uh, so all the facing uh, elements have come out. It's a paper in uh, geotextiles and geomembranes. And um, the, the, the point that he was trying to make was that after the forensic analysis that the design of the wall used a proprietary software program, which did not consider connection strength. It assumes that the connection is equal to the tensile strength or whatever. So then they removed, they, they looked at a proper design. In fact, there was a, 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 a bay, water bay here somewhere, some water detention center. So they, were, they did a proper seepage analysis. Okay, they did a proper seepage analysis and reconstructed the complete thing and um, um, estimated all the, you know, forces because you can't change much, you know, so they, they did uh, uh, like, you know, trying to lower the, uh, uh, even the phreatic surface here and then constructing a BAM here to improve the stability and all of that, it was uh, fine. 
again it was a rigorous analysis and uh, this is another very very important uh, thing the uh, airport in agar airport in us very recently it was a 73 meter high slope you know it's uh, you know even we have been thinking of uh, uh, very long i mean heights i mean even 100 meters and all we are ready people are ready but then uh, what could happen like it failed in 2015 march 2015 and it destroyed multiple homes and churches blocked a creek resulting in major flood and disrupted airport operations like you can see that uh, you know it's close to the runway or something like this is completely a failure you can see that you know um, so the slope damaged uh, power lines sanitary sewer lines and it, it was really um, a big one you know you have even papers coming on this uh, very interesting analysis by different people you know like uh, different people go and have different opinions like right as usual uh, but then you know what are the lessons that we are going to learn here it's a uh, very in- interesting uh, when it is such a complex structure there are insufficient surface exploration program you know subsurface program and interpretation of the yeah it is a, a subsurface okay so um, there there was not much uh, detailing inter- interpretation was not really okay then they ignored 3d effects like a very interesting thing is that you know i saw you saw that uh, it failed like a you know we assume that um, uh, the uh, the tensile strength is only in one direction but the other directions it, it need not be considered but here is a case since it's actually uh, in a sort of a, a you know it uh, this thing so they need to, the 3d aspects of the uh, uh, india axial geographies used were uh, is is in axial so the problem is that uh, that contributed to some problem and there were a lot of deformations in other directions so maybe it led to some this is available in ac journal latest and your textiles also so other thing that they were mentioning was that the insufficient foundation preparation okay and the rock excavation and bench benching due to inadequate specifications and construction plans then f- founding the reinforced such and compacted soil instead of the freshly excavated rock see this is a very interesting thing that <laughs> like why can't you have a compacted soil so what would have happened it is a very tricky thing that we should analyze then there was some shortening of the reinforcement somewhere in some places maybe sometimes the design did it then there was a very important point deterioration of the soil rock interface in fact this uh, it this also happens in most of the cases i have seen you have a rock and you have a soil but the rain comes the at the interface all the water starts uh, percolating and then that leads to slide landslide or even we have seen in many cases and so deter that shear strength comes down from peak value to the residual value like you know peak value to whatever are the parameters that we do for soil or rock so that that led to problems and even there was a water ground water or you know sometimes you know rain water can also contribute it and it led to failure then inappropriate selection testing design and analysis of uh, materials so this is something that they mentioned very uh, what are the other things that uh, as i said of course the incomplete design and then they also um, said there is no chimney drain there is no blanket drain there is no peer review uh, the the constructability monitoring you know say for example uh, was it okay like uh, there were no records uh, i mean statements that everything is okay for construction say whether like somebody says the rocky surface or the soil surface there is lack of lack, lack of understanding here then the lack of monitoring program you know when it's such a big slope is there 73 meter high slope and uh, there was not much monitoring done and uh, incomplete evaluation of the observed tension crack it looks like there was a tension crack somewhere but uh, the effects are not understood or even it was not maybe it was ignored we don't know exactly but there was some problems issue the other thing that uh, very interesting uh, important uh, one that we should understand is that in all of this slope stability we understand that the factor of safety is of 1.3 is okay that's what we do whether it's a reinforced soil slope or whether it is a normal slope but the problem is that it's not uh, these are all the old code codal provisions uh, i it saves uh, time or at work in uh, small embankments or some even dams also but uh, uh, the fact is particularly in reinforced soil it's a deform the when you want a factor of safety of 1.3 you are allowing more deformations but then that is may not be acceptable in the case of a reinforced soil reinforced soil structures so we should be very careful in uh, looking at uh, what should be the factors of safety this one thing so if you want to look at all of these numbers you know what are the issues you know like one can say that the connection failures you have you have 
issues of fine grain soils in the backfill. You have compaction of fine grain soils. You know, is it possible to compact them properly, particularly close to facing? Uh, are the internal drainage systems all right? Or how do you compact or you know surface and adjacent water control? Do you have any guidelines in India, or what is that uh, everybody is doing? Because you, when you say we have hundred people doing, you know, when uh, then what are the other additional construction design issues that could be site specific? We'll just see one by one. Uh, I, I just say that the connection failures, like you know, as I said, uh, you know, the loads on the connection are essentially the maximum tensile force that we have, and uh, so the uh, if there is a, a looseness somewhere close to that particular uh, connection and all of that, that could lead to a lot of uh, problems of moment, and you know, it should be properly done, particularly in the case of uh, steel structures. I, I, of course, some companies have come up with their own uh, connections and then make sure that their connection. Uh, strength is perfect in all the conditions. Uh, that should be maybe necessary, and the proper strength test for even steel connections need to be established and done. And maybe both in the lab and field, because sometimes you know we don't know. So some somebody can have a quick testing in the field. In fact, we did 20 years back, long time. Uh, so the mix and match of uh, different products, such as facing connections without proper standardization, is dangerous and maybe uh, it lead to. So it's better to standardize a few products. Uh, see, we try to use uh, clays, fine grained soils, uh, in because of the distinct advantage of cross, and we can't get sa sand everywhere. But then we have to understand their behavior. There is no shortcut here because you want to uh, see. You know that that uh, material is quite useful, uh, but then uh, you don't have sand. So even fly ash, whatever marginal materials one can use, but let one should understand their behavior completely. Like say, as I said like permeability behavior you know they say for example if the rate of uh, the rainfall intensity is so higher than the uh, permeability value then there will be inundation you know like that then the undrained drain shear strength and only we study in the books but i never saw any data on any of this um uh, why i am telling is that even the moisture density relationship like you know what, what how what is the relation between density we do have but the main problem is modulus if the modulus is not good like you know i just showed you like instead of 20 mpa or 50 mpa or 60 mpa if it is it's good but if it is 20 or 10 mpa <laughs> that material is not okay like i should tell you about barry christopher barry christopher is a person who wrote federal highway codes uh, he came to IIC long back and, and he's a good friend, good friend of many people. He's a quite a senior person. He, he writes in one of his uh, papers and what is happening, what, how to use fine grain soils. He clearly says that if you don't understand them, uh, then is, there is a problem. But unfortunately, the courts do not explicitly mention that. Uh, like, you know, what should be the, we may do, because we are already doing testing material, material, material testing is done already. So you have to pick up the value and uh, mention it somewhere. And say that yeah, if you have this much of uh, stiffness and this this is a very good compaction, this is what it means. And if what water also is there, also this is what it means. So some sort of understanding should be there. There's nothing more than that, so that one can interpret. Like once you go to the site, uh, if you look at the record, then you can say that yeah, the soil is not well compacted, so that may not be the reason. You know, you can eliminate some reasons. Uh, that's what I want to say. Uh, so that's what I was just mentioning. The, of course, people may not do it. Uh, you know, the densities and corresponding modulus shall be evaluated for laboratory and specified. Somebody should because we do a lot of laboratory testing for backfill. Uh, I mean, so wall fill. And uh, if the wall fill is not completely characterized and you just do some C, find C and phi, you don't know what it is. It will be dangerous. And the other one is the lift thicknesses. In fact, I think this has been a big problem. The concept of the lift thickness is very, very clear that, you know, to ensure proper density and modulus, this is given. But if people want to dump in the night and then make it 600 mm, it is very dangerous. Uh, I mean, so it's very, very tricky. And uh, that leads to a lot of problems. So the backfill material needs to be compacted. There should be uh, some systems of evaluation uh, because, uh, you know, you have even NDT methods also. I mean, so one should be very clear. And uh, there are some tips that people say that if you have, uh, uh, you know, use of longer reinforcements at the top, provision of proper chimney drains is all by design. Surface slopes taking into surface water uh, away from the slope should be used. Geocomposites, in fact, there are a lot of uh, uh, debate in India that, you know, the geocomposites are very excellent material, but somehow because of their use, or in fact, the IRC code says that you can use them instead of, uh, you can use instead of the, 
uh, gravel, uh, you can use geocomposites. Uh, there, there are some failures. There is some discussion. That, that problem is there. But I, I should tell you that just composite is a good product. But I don't know if we are using it properly. We are, uh, you know, that's one thing we should see. There is a nice uh, quotation in Federal Highway Guidelines that you should actually assume that there is a, you should design for drainage. Like um, adequate drainage features are required unless engineering determines that such features are not needed for the specific project. At least rainfall is there. You know, there's uh, definitely surface drainage. Everything is there. Surface drainage, subsurface drainage is there. So you consider the site-specific uh, data. Like if you're doing in uh, like a, we did, you know, if you have 6,000 mm rainfall per year, say for example, Mangalore or Bangalore, anywhere, if the rainfall is so much, if you don't uh, have any record of how do you address that, it is very difficult, whether it is a road payment, whether it is a retaining wall, we just don't seem to address this drainage design at all. And so in the internal and external drainage provisions in the event of rainfall, both surface and subsurface drainage need to be designed. And one in 100, in fact, I was just looking at for one of the designs. There's a lot of difference. You, you have to consider it because a lot of failures happened in Kerala or anywhere because of the landslides we had and one in 100 uh, rainfall only. But uh, since uh, we ignored that during construction, it is dangerous. So we should have proper uh, design document, drainage design document also. And uh, what kind of seepage uh, forces you have and drainage measures, you know, because it's again, a, a, a prop, uh, it, is it is what is causing problem. You know, we have seen most of the failures are because of the rain, the saturation and all of that. Then the, uh, the geocomposite, I was just mentioned this, um, uh, drainage level 600 mm versus geocomposite needs to be evaluated and proper. It should be, you know, so for example, if there is a, somebody was mentioning to me that uh, they, they have used a loamy material next to the geo, uh, geocomposite, it got, it got clogged. So if it gets clogged, I think geocomposite doesn't work. So like that. So you have to see the conditions under which those things perform better. Ah, so this is something that, you know, an example that in fact, it's also given the federal highway that in a ways of uh, poor drainage management, you have a, a RE wall, but you have a hill slope, I mean, road construction, then you have a seepage and, you know, you, you the uh, pavement engineer does his job very nicely, but then you have an RE wall trying to construct and I don't know the same contractor, you may not be same contractor most of the time, uh, but that could lead to problems, right? If you don't understand what is happening to this, how is the drainage provisions are made and then you construct RE wall, then it's all right. So this is something that uh, very, very important. There are a lot of examples. Even actually, the other thing I was looking at IRC guidelines for the drainage. You know, in fact, we look at uh, six grade uh, six gradation characteristics. See, there is what is called internal stability. Like you know, you the grain side distribution has varieties of particle sizes. Some finer particles should not clog a wider, a bigger sizes. You know, we call that as internally unstable. Some materials may fall into that category. One should be really careful in choosing the right materials for gradation characteristics. Uh, you know, for the uh, filtration. So these are all some examples, uh, you know, uh, they gave that, you know, you have to see that if you have a reinforced cell, what table, you have to consider the, all the forces that are there properly. What are the force, uplift forces and the lateral forces and, you know, or re retaining forces. So you have to really understand as an engineer completely, what are the forces that should be designed. And this could be an example, how it can be done in a proper way. These are all available. Just, I want to flash it. Uh, so that we have all of this information in a reasonable way. Uh, this is another example of how uh, one can do on a um, uh, internal drainage or both. So uh, I just want to uh, mention that um, there are also additional design constraints. Say, for example, uh, you know, some RE walls could be on the pile. Uh, you know, so for example, you have eight meters is the length of the uh, reinforcement. Four, four meters on the pile cap and the next is uh, four meters is on the uh, backfill some soil, native soil or something, then it could lead to some problems. So people have already, of course, some of them have already looked at it. And then uh, since it contributes to different settlement, uh, you know, slip joints or be provided. And some cases I know that uh, ground improvement is not uh, done properly. Uh, you know, if, if it, it is not done properly, definitely the geosynthetic soil uh, structure being a flexible structure, though it tolerates deformation, but not beyond a point, you know, the head has, so it can lead to a lot of problems. So we have seen many cases in, uh, they don't even come once you suggest that it needs some improvement, they will not come back because it's not quoted in the uh, thing, you know, work. So then narrow backfills in some cases, 
uh, you know, the, uh, the you may not have an adequate space to even provide the adequate length, say, for example, 0.7H, if you want to say, it's not possible. So what should be done? So we have a lot of uh, methods of analysis, uh, but then, you know, this is an excellent technique that uh, we should really uh, overcome all of these barriers. And of course, utilities and permanent structures are also there. That also needs to be considered. So we need to come up with some plans, clarity on working on most of these issues. And um, yeah, so the, the, the way forward that I, I just want to mention would be that um, the uh, documentation of failures and lessons learned to establish best practices. Of course, we can learn from the failure of in other cases. We have, I think we have enough information in failures in India. Uh, so, but uh, how you, our objective should be to establish best practices in the country. And, uh, you know, the, even you can see how the failure investigation is done in our country and other countries, like, you know, like I showed you some the case study, they're quite clean, clean, clear. So we can even work on the systems there. And of course we can establish, we know things much better. There should be collective efforts. And in, uh, in fact, uh, see, National Highway is the biggest uh, agency which do maximum work on our walls. Um, then the categorization of clients, you have highways, you have railways, you have privates and others. And, uh, you know, you have a lot of arrivals in private sector also. They also have a lot of problems uh, because, uh, you know, it, it has been quite tricky to handle that. And so we have to make some collective efforts uh, and maybe the Association of Bridge Engineers can uh, do some, uh, take steps on this or even with all NHI and all others, you know, manufacturers, you know, and the construction and observation, the construction observations and review of field reports during construction need to be done by site civil engineers and geotechnical engineers. I was looking at the federal highway and other guidelines. There is a very, very clear distinction that they need to have a geotechnical engineer in the site. But you know, I have seen most of the sites as there will be some um, um, person who do not have even engineering background in uh, you know in uh, you know in construction. He will not even know about compaction. So that was a case that I saw in some cases. So my concern is that I think we should, uh, you know, you are uh, whatever you want to do because you're all uh, the, uh, working on these lines. You should have a good site engineer who knows about info soil and drainage, particularly the drainage provisions. The geotechnical engineers also should be there, you know. Uh, you know. So NCMA guidelines clearly specify the roles of each of the parties involved, including the role of civil engineer as well as geotechnical. So we have to be very, very specific in roles of each of that. Of course, in paper, you may do, but in practice, it should be done. And of course, the, some of the software, as I said, they, they will not consider the effects of seepage and that, you know, they just do whatever, you know, so there because the, it is cumbersome, so it is not easy. So we need to, you know, particularly, in, you know, as I just mentioned in earlier slides, that somehow this sort of, um, uh, it should be done. It should be you know, checked and, you know, because that too, the drainage design is something not uh, well understood. And uh, very, when you're designing the tensile elements for one in hundred years, but what is that we are doing for drainage here? Like if one in 50 year or one in hundred rainfall comes and then damages our structure, we, it is very problem, no? right? So we can't tolerate it. So uh, I feel that, you know, it's a big exercise for all of us to understand. And we have to have a, com a comprehensive inspection manual and checklist. Uh, with regard to construction that's what my personal opinion is that of course you already have i think what i was uh, knowing with a lot of my other colleagues that i have you know who have been doing a lot of this good construction they have a very good uh, checklist and manuals and all of that so i'm sure that uh, we should just come up with uh, you know we should educate our own brothers who are not doing good construction you know nobody is at fault and you know there, there could be some issues i think we should easily resolve it and let us take this as a you know very good opportunity to resolve and do better. So thank you very much. This is what I would like to say. Thank you. Uh, this is, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, excellent presentation. In fact, you have highlighted most of the problems through a uh, few case studies and you have also given us, uh, enlightened us with some of the statistics of failures uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, which shows that uh, what are the reasons for failures in what kind of percentage that uh, given us a way forward what are the directions in which we have to move to uh, kind of mitigate the risk and avoid uh, failures uh, uh, now i would like to go to our uh, panelists and since 
our uh, mr r k pandey ji has to uh, you know go out for a meeting so without uh, any further ado i would like to invite uh, 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 mr r k pandey who is the member projects nhi to kindly give his views on this presentation and on the whole on the subject of uh, ariwal uh, there are so many failures we have seen sir in the recent past what is the direction or what is the way forward what we should do to prevent such failures uh, what are your views sir uh, over to you arkit pandey can you hear me yes sir yes sir yes sir uh, good evening everyone as, as far as presentation is concerned excellent presentation it, in fact it answers most of the thing the point is when uh, you know as a highway engineer i'll see uh, the use of arival we started uh, when uh, the national highway development project was launched but uh, that when the nsdp was launched and we started utilizing arival uh, relatively it was a new concept for us and we were very particular if you'll go back and see the contact document the kind of contact document which we have entered you'll find the kind of condition number 1 the manufacturer will give back to back guarantee for the 50 years the life of the structure then a minimum thickness of this the uh, no block will be allowed then only metallic kind of things will be allowed because of course it was because we never tried it and we then uh, didn't have that kind of confidence in it over a period of time we saw that it survived of course i'll say despite of the fact that all those kind of conditions were there there were failure but those failure were a few and uh, for the first time when i met uh, professor babu it was on a side where uh, one of our project there was a failure of uh, ariwal after construction of five years and then uh, we met there and started discussing about the ariwals over a period of time uh, you know uh, when people have the confidence uh, we started building as it uh, no rocket science is involved and it is a ordinary structure and anybody and everybody can do it nothing wrong in it as well because today what is happening is Uh, if i compare nsdp and today's requirement that time we were um, our main focus on four laning and uh, providing crossing facilities means underpasses are a, a very very few where we used to provide a underpass in 10 km or 15 km today because of the road safety i'll have to provide uh, underpass at each and every junction number 2 the cost of land has gone very high so i can't um, you know go ahead with the uh, normal slopes so ariwal is a must but it is also a fact because we have open it everybody and anybody is doing it not only uh, and they have come out with different forms unfortunately we didn't understand the different forms uh, there is nothing wrong in different forms as well but the requirement of uh, you know sustaining a structure in different form is uh, slightly different and uh, that we have not captured it you know it is unfortunate that we have witnessed number of failure but at the same time it has given us lot of data lot of data is available and you have seen that uh, not much is to be done we have lot of data lot of analysis has been done what is to be done is to translate it in the form of guidelines today unfortunately if you see our codal provisions uh, we are not very specific you know uh, uh, we uh, if we even i'll give you a very simple example for construction of a minor bridge i'll have to carry out survey investigation and bore log at each you know abutment foundation. location at each foundation but when it comes to ariwal uh, or flyover i have nothing to say we said no, it's a highway work you can do it so what is required is we'll have to bring out our guidelines which will not only talk about survey and investigation different form when how what to adopt what not to adopt and also the different type of testing requirement you know if i you see my uh, bituminous road you will find what kind of tests are required what is the frequency can we have that kind of frequency and testing requirement for the arival it is not for the arival but for the uh, compaction of the earth also here again we are we we'll have to differentiate between ordinary compaction of uh, you know normal embankment and the uh, compaction for the arival here the restraints are number uh, there are many uh, restraints which we are not taking into account in our uh, guidelines so perhaps on the basis of the uh, failure 
data is available with us let us come out with rather uh, amplify the uh, whatever codal provisions of irc make it more practical there is no doubt in it whatever uh, guidelines whatever best practice we adopt failure are inevitable there will be certain failure failure of our wall it puts most of our uh, field engineers in lm they have no answer to it what to do what not to do and when we are talking about highways where i can't keep it close for long at least we should have sort you know some of the measures which we'll have to take up in the case of failure what to do how to handle those kind of failure it will uh, bring out all these i think it will help us a lot and uh, make our life simple and uh, we will be in a position to achieve our targets the way we are looking for thank you thank you thank you pandit ji i think you have made few excellent points uh, uh, particularly the last one which you mentioned about to bring out a kind of guidance note on how to handle uh, you know failures and what to do as a remedial measures uh, there are there are hardly any guideline on that and uh, it would be nice to have that and secondly to improve our own uh, guideline sp102 uh, i think which is on arival and that needs an improvement and uh, probably uh, uh, you know lessons learned from all these failures can help us to improve that guideline strengthen that guideline so that we we can have a a a, a guideline based on which design will be safer thank you very much sir uh, i would now uh, call upon mr rajiv ahuja who is a, a designer hardcore designer he is i think handling uh, on behalf of the contractor on many apc contracts he is handling the is a interface between the contractor and the manufacturer so he is he is he is uh, i think let us hear him uh, his views on uh, arival the failures and the remedy mr rajiv ahuja kindly unmute yourself and i have been muted thank you very yeah, much thank you thank you and let uh, let me thank dr shiva kumar who has given an excellent presentation see the ground realities are different see i have been involved with the epc contractor for a very very long time i have interacted very closely with the arival uh, vendors most of them as well as the design consultants and the uh, engineers of the epc contractor as dr shiva kumar said there is a communication gap among all the engineers that's very very true it starts with the arival designer with due uh, respect to them whenever i see the drawing in first submission it is very clear it's very casually done the details are missing because they are used to running a software they have standard designs for various height from 2 meter to 15 meter they will produce that they have standard gad and they will give the drawings but the, when you look at the drawing you find a lot of things missing they will always mention that safe bearing capacity required is so much for various height they will never uh, clarify what is this safe bearing capacity because as a bridge engineer we understand safe bearing capacity is ultimate bearing capacity divided by a factor of safety 2.5 for rigid foundation whereas ari walls are designed with limit set method so there the safe bearing capacity is basically ultimate bearing capacity now simply omitting the word ultimate has created so much of confusion i have myself faced it number of times when that in one case the execution has been done and somebody read the note for a height of for say 10 meter safe bearing capacity is 45 ton per square meter and the comment was it is not possible to get 45 and they called some plate uh, they did some plate load test and that fellow gave 10 ton per square meter without understanding that plate load test has its severe limitation because of plate size arival base is 8 meter then you have to test the strata for a depth of 1.5 times the base width and not a plate load test and the work was suspended and it took me 4 months to solve the problem because i had to educate all the engineers at site including contractors engineer as well as the thought engineer that what is this 40 by 10 per square meter i showed them the designs uh, uh, luckily in sp102 irc sp102 there is a solved example i told them this is ultimate bearing pressure is not a normal bearing pressure he said then why it is not written since that day whenever i saw, see a drawing from arival designer i tell them please write ultimate because they they are not familiar what is being done on other foundation so wherever i am involved i always force on force this on them second issue i find they will they will always write desired bearing capacity i mean they should add ultimate 
they do not insist on a proper soil report from EPC contractor. When we ask them, they say EPC contractor has not given us any soil report. And they are forced to submit their designs. And they don't want to lose the job because if they say, unless you give us soil report, we will not design, the contractor may go to somebody else. So they give you the design and a conditional design where they will say the bearing capacity is so much, ground improvement is not our responsibility, settlement calculation is not our responsibility, all kinds of writers they will add and give to the contractor. Now contractor starts constructing. It is neither seen by the proof consultant, nor by his own designer, nor by a third engineer, because everybody thinks Arival is not our baby. It's solely responsibility of Arival designer. We have nothing to do with that. But there has to be active involvement of one person who sees this as a total package. One design by Arival designer, then geotechnical investigation, and how that geotechnical investigation has to be utilized. That is very important. It may have clay, it may have uh, silt. And mostly I find if there is a clay, nobody is doing settlement calculation. And even if they do, they do it wrongly. Now clay can be normally consolidated, pre-consolidated, over-consolidated. The post-construction allowable settlement is 100 mm, which is not known to many, even the Arival designer also sometimes don't know this. They don't know how to make calculation. Many times I have done this calculation myself. When you uh, consider this a normally consolidated clay, you find CC, related to the uh, liquid limit, which is very high. So you either overestimate, you end up overestimating the settlements, and then you start uh, you know, suggesting ground, costly ground improvement, which may not be required at all. There's a lack of knowledge among uh, our even designers also. I mean, especially people who are you know, young people, they don't have enough experience. I mean, I, I mean, it seems, to me it seems, I'm sorry to say that, that their designs are not checked by their senior people. I, I can tell you many instances where the design submitted were very, very quickly. I will give you one more example. Drainage. They will not take any responsibility of drainage. They will simply show a perforated pipe in the cross-section. That's all. Now, your Arival may be 300, 400 meter long. That perforated pipe has to have outlet at a regular interval. Now, they should make a drawing showing the outlet of the, the pipe, perforated pipe, and then, but nobody shows. And obviously, when you show outlet at a regular interval, the Arival panel should have a hole. I have not seen that kind of hole anywhere, though in drawing, you can see the longitudinal pipe. There has to be a hole, you know, which works as an outlet. Then most of them miss the downtake pipe. You know, the top surface is paved and the water will flow, of course, longitudinally, but you have to give a downtake pipe. Many of them invariably miss downtake pipe. I insist that you have to give a downtake pipe. And when you give a downtake pipe at the bottom, at near the service road level ground, or where the water goes, if you have a service road just below the downtake pipe, you should give a chamber, catch pit chamber, and connect a pipe so that water is drained beyond the uh, service road. All these details are missing. You may have a retaining wall at the end of the embankment, you know, sloping embankment. Sometimes ROW is limited and you have a full formation width, and then uh, you have a sloping uh, surface they won't show any drainage arrangement. That's very dangerous because water flows very fast over the sloping embankment. You have to give a U-shaped drain. Our IRC SP42 shows all the arrangements. Most of the Arival designers are not even familiar with IRC SP42. I have given them many times, you know, relevant uh, references. So, and another issue is, apart from ground improvement and uh, lack of geotechnical investigation, third part is the top. Now, top, we may have a friction slab with crash barriers. We may have a approach slab. In a, when there, the pavement is rigid, we may have a transition slab. Now, how do you, you know, prepare proper drawing? At that, that's the job of the structural consultant. Now, structural consultant also takes it very easy. It's not my job. Uh, I mean, Arival fellow has to do it. Now, you have to make sure that there has to be a gap between top of the Arival and crash barrier so that loads are not transferred to the Arival. Many failures are only because of that, because there is a vehicular impact and the panels come out, I have seen myself. And in Arival drawing, in the first set at least, that gap is not shown properly. It has to be filled with some flexible material. They should give a blow up of that, you know, that view and educate the site engineers that there is a gap. You have to ensure the gap. Similarly, approach slab should never rest on the Arival, whether it's a cross Arival or longitudinal Arival, it should not rest directly. In most of the drawing you will see, which are made to a small scale, you know, and people do it. it. It rests on the wall, and that's why there are problems. 
so they have to worry about that and it's the job of a structural consultant to see that details are prepared properly another issue is arrival should it be rest on pile cap or should it be away from pile cap it's a very very important topic our these days our road formation width is very large four lane six lane okay and you may have a pile cap width which is very limited so if you keep it on pile cap arrival it has certain advantage because it is close to the abutment the gap slab between the dirt wall and arrival will be very small but in transverse direction it partly rests on soil and then partly rests on pile cap there is a differential settlement between the two even if you give slip joints the fact is there is a differential settlement and the arrival which is resting on pile cap is rigid it's a resting on rigid support when the soil settles it will compress the geo grids and which will increase force in the connection so it's a debate now whether we should because it has certain advantage but i feel lot of disadvantage it should be always away from the pile cap the moment you keep it away from pile cap your pile cap size may not will not be less than 5 meter it may be 5 meter 6 meter 8 meter now half of that may be 2.5 3 meter so already gap slab is 3 meter and if you have a better inward better say 1 degree or 2 degree the gap slab span may be 4 to 5 meter now how do you connect it to the uh, you know embankment behind you have a 4 5 meter uh, uh, gap slab and it, it has to continue backward rest on the soil field again the gap between underneath of this slab and uh, cross wall has to be ensured so these are small small thing which are all you know many of these are explained in ircsp 102 I, I can tell you if you read it carefully, it talks about testing. What test should be conducted for backfill material, for retained soil or uh, reinforced earth soil? It talks about the frequency of the test, and uh, it talks about settlements. It talks about ground improvement, quality control measure, lot of things. Maybe it's not a perfect document, but I tell you, if people read that document, they will be, I think, learn a lot. And of course, the problem is from site also. At site, this work is done by very lower level people. they may not be a skilled people they are not able to read the method statement given by arival supplier he gives a method statement it's a very nice document if you read it and follow it i am sure nothing will happen but people don't read it they don't don't read uh, english and uh, arival vendor will send his technician now his technician also he cannot send good technician on all the sites okay it is your luck if you get a good, good technician otherwise he is not able to educate people working at site and another thing the pressure Unfortunately, in our country, to EPC contractor, not enough time is given for design-related activity. It has a word engineering, but for engineering, you have to do soil investigation, you have to do a survey, you have to do the design. There has to be proof checking. You need six months time. But if you you know start monitoring contractor from day one and uh, start threatening him, that penalty will be levied on the first milestone. Contractor doesn't know what to do, so he pressurizes everybody. He will pressurize the arrival vendor. He will pressurize his own engineers. and then all this quality control measure we are talking they go out of window nobody is doing 200 mm thickness compaction the way we expect them to do and even the filling as filling also may not be up to the mark because he is not getting that material uh, maybe uh, there is a problem so he will dump uh, fines and all those things happen at site under pressure i think uh, in the last i would say the consultants prime consultant has to take the overall responsibility and guide the contractor how we should go about the problem and as a epc contractor he has to you know not he should not take this thing lightly he has to educate his people his quality control people that these are the quality measure we have to ensure otherwise consequences can be serious and a guideline in this regard a very simple guideline which is understandable by everybody including testers will go a long way in helping you know our friends i have a lot to say but i think time is very limited thank you very much Uh, uh, thank you thank you rajiv i think uh, you have hit the nail on the head and uh, i can tell you uh, let me also share little bit of my experience which exactly replicates what rajiv mentioned uh, i won't name the project i won't name the manufacturer but we received some i mean you are very right that nobody takes the responsibility for the overall safety and this is the hard reality and in one of the project i received a set of drawings from of arival for a project duly signed by uh, the manufacturer as well as the design consultant completely signed and when i and i we were the proof checker and when we saw the drawings we found that 
nothing is there no geotechnical investigation report is there and the geotechnical the ari wall drawing is signed by the design consultant and done by the manufacturer only one small note is written that the design is with the assumption of this that shall be ascertained i mean this is the level of engineering we are talking about nowadays where without a geotechnical investigations being done the manufacturer is providing the drawings for execution duly signed by the design consultant when we confronted the design consultant he says this is not my responsibility i have to sign as per the document that's why i signed but i have not checked so this is the uh, this is precisely what uh, i think is a problem that uh, nobody i mean the, actually it is a more of a contractual problem i can tell you because nowadays more of the most of the projects are on epc mode so uh, uh, even the manufacturer in, the, in his contract with the contractor uh, he commits only very bare minimum things this is uh, exclusions are more than the inclusions mm -hmm. so that yes. the, the the total cost comes down and thereafter he says that by this was not my responsibility this was that was not my responsibility it was supposed to be given by me and the design consultant so in many projects i face this situation where some of the things are nobody's responsibility and only when you know as somebody points out then it it is figured that okay now you this is a variation you do this thank you rajiv i think you you have made your points so i before i go to our two uh, eminent manufacturers representatives i would like dr jimmy thomas who is uh, an expert geotechnical consultant with huge experience on ari wall i know uh, kindly give your view sir on this on this issue yeah good afternoon and it is good nice afternoon. to be here on this panel and on this very important and hot topic i think mr rajiv ji has given a wonderful explanation of what are the <laughs> real side problems and these are the facts i also accept most of the things but then uh, by only take will be like is it fair to blame the arival agency like uh, like i also agree it's a very common practice to give the designs drawings without sufficient data but then like uh, let us accept see they have to also and their bread they have to do the business like it is not that they are happy to do this see any agency any designer would love to have all the data before they give the designs drawings but unfortunately like it doesn't happen like so like uh, i would say like the epc contractor has to take a major responsibility like like he has to give the data on time like geotechnical investigations the level sometimes i know like the arival agency have to revise the drawing so many times like sometimes three four times like they make the drawing the next day say like the levels are changed and sometimes they not paid for that also like that so the epc contractor has to take a much greater responsibility like geotechnical investigations all levels then all the interface like arival has to properly interface with the structures like in their crash barrier details so the, those details have to be given like that and another thing they have to thoroughly review the designs because once the design and drawings are submitted to epc contractor most cases they just simply forwarded to the independent consultant without any review but like as the epc contractor they have to properly review is there something wrong something missing like uh, that by the addition they have to do that so that is very important then uh, regarding the perception of failures like how many failures occur is it bad like i also feel like from perceptions like that it is too high but what is the real percentage unfortunately like there are a lot of failures there are investigations but finally like you don't see any like authentic reports actually like are these published like that like we don't see many papers like it's all facts and figures like that like every week or so like one failure occurs like there is a discussion like that but i would love like i would respectfully submit to nha because they are the like owners and they the maximum number of people they can be published in like a white paper like for the past 20 years or so like what are the failures what are the reasons some authentic statistics based on that we have to proceed otherwise like uh, is it the rate of failure of ari walls more than other conventional retaining structures like we see lot of failures of like concrete or masonry walls is it higher we don't know 
Like, there are a lot of payment failures, like building failures like that. So, because is it that because are we is something a new technology? We are looking at with suspicion. Like, are we seeing that? Like, are we fair to this? Because like, let's not forget that for every R evolve which have failed, like there are 50 or 100 which are performing very well also. Let's not forget that. So, and regarding uh, the failure investigations, because sometimes I find, like, I have a doubt, like, okay, the failure is investigated by expert, but are we drawing the correct conclusions? Are we just pinpointing the correct mechanism? Sometimes I get doubt, actually. Because ideally, the investigation team should consist, this is my opinion, of an academician, because you know, he knows the fundamentals, the basic concepts, he knows thoroughly, plus a designer, plus a, like, expert in construction, actually. Because there could be, like, the, the academicians, okay, they know the broad concepts, but they may not be familiar with the nitty-gritties of design and detailing that. So, unless those experts are also involved in the failure investigation, you may miss the point. Because sometimes I have seen, like, a panel has failed, and an explanation being given because the reason is there is no, like, a pen and groove joined between the panels. Like, I have seen some discussion like that. But actually, this is not required. Like, no, in the case of panels, each panel are supported by number of reinforcements. So even if there is no shear connection between the panels, it should not fail it. And I have seen one proposal, like somebody has suggested, like uh, to prevent this failure, we have to provide a continuous steel rod from top to bottom through the panels like that. So I don't know whether these are all the right conclusions we are drawing the failures and really doubt. Like. Then, uh, like we have guidelines, like it's not that we don't have guidelines because we have good codes, like uh, we have IRC, otherwise we are free to, like even BS, FSWA, good lines are there, but where we are lacking is the implementation actually. Like we are not, uh, we are not able to ensure the compliance with the code actually, especially like connection design probably we are missing. Like one of the most, for the panels, one of the most com common type of failure is the connection failure. And that is actually the, it's the failure of the system itself like that. So that should not happen, like we should not allow. But then who is checking like how these type of uh, designs are being approved? That we have to think actually. So where we are, there is a lacuna in the actual, the checking or review of the designs, that we have to think. And sometimes what happens, even the consultants also, the independent consultant or the authority engineer sometimes, they also may not have experts in are you all design actually like that. So will they get some outside expertise or will they get a third party? That also we have to think actually because they are supposed to review like that. And I also agree with uh, Mr. Hovija's comment that see, even the Arival agency also there is a wide range actually. There are companies with uh, excellent expertise, but there are also agencies with uh, very few people like because the Nowadays, the, the job is about based on the lowest rates, actually. So that is an unfortunate part. That is the reality. That, but then, that uh, is there any lacuna? Then during the review, during the uh, checking and approval, that should be like, uh, rectified, actually. So, and uh, so basically, like, uh, and another, if you look at the root cause, like that, like we are, but I would say that we are not uh, respecting the RE world as a structure. Like, are we seeing it as just earthwork? Like, like we are not doing any geotechnical investigation. Like, uh, proper compaction control, we are not doing. Like, so, are we are we giving enough respect to RE world as a structure? Like, the EPC contractor, the consultants, and uh, like earlier also that view was there. Everything is put on the shoulders of the RE world agency. Like, all the responsibility, so, which is not fair actually. So everybody, like we are all benefiting, like from the, we are able to construct this retaining wall at a very low, very low cost because of this technology. Since we are benefiting, like we have to give give back to the technology also. And another issue was the like uh, it was discussed about ground improvement, like settlement calculation. So like uh, the system in US and to some extent Canada, I'm aware of. Normally the RIVAL agencies they do only the internal stability. Like, the internal stability say the external stability will be done by the like the department of transport or like that and i have personal experiences also like that. when i did a project in canada like the issue of global stability came up so i asked the client actually 
Do I need to check for the global stability? Then straight away he said, no. He asked the geotechnical engineer of Ricard for this project. Global stability is my responsibility. I will check that. Then he did the slope stability analysis, global stability, and some extra reinforcement was given. All that he provided actually. So sometimes the Arival companies also, they have limited expertise. And a company sitting in Delhi, if they are doing a project in Kerala or Assam, they will not have the very much idea like that. So it is ideal like that the external stability part, it is uh, taken separately like that. But then contractually, we have to see like it's create more complications like that. But uh, I find that to be an ideal arrangement. Then probably the EPC contractor, you know, the overall responsibility, like the entire structure. So I think these are my uh, thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jimmy. Uh, you have made your points. And uh, I think your first point was that we should have more statistical data and information on failures so that we, we can focus on areas where we need more attention as compared to areas where we don't uh, perhaps need that much of attention. Then uh, you also mentioned that it is not fair to blame always the Arival manufacturer for all the ills. I agree with you 100%. I, uh, if, if that is the message which was conveyed, then I, I must clarify that no, it is not the Arival manufacturers to be blamed. It is the system, uh, which I mentioned that, you know, in a EPC contract, probably the contractors, uh, you know, the contract with the Arival manufacturer itself is restricted, uh, contract, which, uh, which uh, is not holistic. And that is uh, most of the cases uh, in most of the situations. That is the problem where we don't end up with a holistic, safe solution from one agency. And uh, in, because after all, the Arival uh, design construction is a multidisciplinary activity where you need to have a geotechnical uh, engineer. You need to have a, a structural engineer as well as you need an ex executioner who, who knows the job, how to do it, what are the compaction requirements and all. What happens in most of the contract is that uh, some drawings and designs are originally produced with restricted uh, scope of uh, contract by the Arrival manufacturer. Uh, I'm, I'm only talking of maybe uh, there are exceptions, but I'm in general uh, saying based on my experience. And thereafter, because as Rajiv mentioned that, you know, the, uh, the know-how on the Arival design and, uh, you know, nitty gritties are very, very restricted. The design consultant, uh, you know, close their eyes and somehow the, even the client, even if there is a proof checker, if he doesn't go deep, it will, it will get passed easily. And th there is a huge risk because proper due diligence has not been done. I'm, I'm not blaming any one agency, but it is a collective system which probably um, you know, helps doing that. And then add to it the problem of uh, error during execution. That, that is an added thing, which we know that is an endemic problem, which is not related to Arival alone. It, it is applicable equally to any, any, any construction. I mean, on the whole, the workmanship, we know the issues. So uh, thank you very much. I would now... Uh, invite Dr. Ratnakar Mahajan um, from Mecca-Ferry. Uh, he's an eloquent speaker and I have uh, listened to him in many presentations in the past. And um, I would like to hear and please share your views uh, on, on, on the issue with that we are discussing. Uh, thank you, Alokji. I hope I am audible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, Professor Babu as well as Dr. Jimmy Pandey, sir, as well as Raju sir has made my job quite easy. So maybe some of the areas which I need not to repeat, I will just mention and move forward. I think it's a very good topic. So I must first congratulate the Indian Association of Structural Engineers for taking up this topic, which is being discussed, uh, I think, uh, at such a length and breadth uh, with, uh, you know, big, uh, I would say, variety of experts being there. So I would like to just uh, mention one thing. Uh, before I put on my points, I did my research in reinforced soil and I used to prepare the models in the lab. So IIT Bombay has a very big uh, centrifuge 
where we can build us models which can represent actually a prototype of around 10 to 15 meters very easily. And I used to make the models fail in the lab so that I understand the behavior so that the, 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 the structures in the field doesn't collapse or fail. Now, after learning that and started practicing this technology, you know, let me tell you honestly, this subject is a mix of a uh, number of streams. So it's a geotechnical engineering, structural engineering, and again, uh, polymer engineering, because here we are using geosynthetics. So polymers is something not really covered in our civil engineering curriculum. We may be knowing certain things. So even being working in this field more than, uh, let's say, decade now, almost 14, 15 years, still polymer is an area, you know, a little gray for me. So what it comes from this is, okay, this technology is, is proven, no doubt about it. So what are the reasons of failures? What are the different things which happens? And I will, I will go to again the title, where, what are the remedies or way forward? So uh, having said, this is a multidisciplinary approach. So here we need to really take care of uh, the structure engineering aspect as well as geotechnical and the polymer engineering. So when it comes to the geotechnical engineering, you know, the, the reinforced soil has a major component as the soil. And what Dr. Jimmy has clearly pointed, it's not really an earthwork just earthwork, but it is a structure. So this is somewhere, you know, maybe sometimes a message get uh, miscommunicated that this is majority soil work, but it's not so. So what is very important in soil is if you compact it properly, your structure will be fine. What I have seen, I started looking at the structures when I was, you know, initially a designer, where uh, what uh, Pandesar also mentioned, initially the, the, the quality was very good very good structures, but now the scale has increased. So what I observed, the, the quality conscious approach that time what we had, the compaction, 200 mm thickness is being mentioned. Why this 200 mm has to be understood first of all? Why not it's 500 mm? Because we have some compactors, they can transmit some compaction energy to a certain depth. From there, it's coming, 200 mm. So if we are not respecting that 200 mm thickness, Finally, it will show, the structure will show its effect, maybe immediately after construction or, or maybe two, three years. What I have seen from my site's team, like they are reporting, sir, here, char uh, mm compaction ho hai, sir, raat mein kar hai, sir, you know. So, so there is a, there is a, uh, when we have worked with a very good, uh, our, uh, I would say collaborators or business partners, typically contractors who are our clients. So if they have really quality conscious and look, taking these manuals, very, I would say, kind of a guideline to be followed, the structure comes out very well. I will share one small personal experience. We were, uh, being a global company, we, we needed to construct a 22 meter high structure in Peru first time with the technology, what we are offering with the polymeric street. We had sent our one person for only four days because it's international travel from India. And the guy explained everything, what is to be done, how it is to be done. We handed over a manual and we have a structure of 22 meter high constructed in Peru. And we use that photograph in many of our presentation because the, the approach being understood at site and being implemented. So as I explained, soil is one part, compaction is very important. Checks on the quality of the soil. That is very important. Now there are some guidelines being given in 3000 cubic meter meat do some checking this much. If we follow that, I think you are getting a major part of the structure getting covered. The second part is about the fascia type. So we have blocks, panels, uh, gabions, uh, wrap around, and very importantly, connection is being cited as one of the major failures because in India, I have seen, I, I can classify majority of the failures are connection failures. So what is the uh, reason? Could be a poor detailing, could be a compromise in connection. Is it so? So how, how do we go, go about it? I think connection must be a mandatory requirement. Whatever system you are providing, whatever the reinforced soil technology you are providing, the way the reinforcement is connected to the fascia must be tested in a lab prior. You, know, you do it once, fine, but it must be tested that lab has to have some accreditation or we will own lab. That is very important. If that is not being done, then we are having a risk of the kind of failures we are seeing. So 
one is the calculations part you may do some calculations and provide but you know laboratory test if you do then you are assured okay this is what the number you are getting and then must check whatever test has been carried out the same connection is adopted in the field there shall not be any deviation so this could be a way forward you know making the connection of the reinforcement to the fascia to be mandatory for all the project that the a, the agency must provide a test report then when we are using the reinforcement there are different material factors like these these reinforcement will be subjected to creep for a long period of time this will be subjected to damage during construction there will be reduction in the strength due to the, the chemical reaction or weathering you say no so all these things are again not easily to be understood by a general consultant you know so what do we do in this case because creep test is typically we are using these structures for 120 years design life so you must do a creep test for a certain duration at least 10000 hours or if you are having a longer test 10 20 years it's good so how do we understand this because you will require your textile engineer and polymer engineer so the way forward for this is as a civil engineer if you are not competent to to check this you can demand a certification there are certifications available these certifications are third party independent certification just to give you an idea british board of agreement is a bbs certificate if uh, if this technology to be used in uk in highways it is mandatory they must have a certification so if you have this certification then you are assured okay whatever numbers you are considering for your material they are being mentioned there there is another certification also there is a ntpp certification which is uh, from uh, usa so you can have even ntpp certification both these agencies bp and ntpp they evaluate these factors independently and then provide a certificate with the required numbers which governs actually the performance of the structure so i would say for reinforcement making certifications as one of the criteria gives you a, a kind of assurance as well as confidence okay whatever is going in the structure is of of certain quality then another part we are talked of a ground improvement you know this is after doing phd in geotechnical engineering <laughs> when i started designs this was a truth in front of me all bridge structure whether it is abutment or pier you will have a bore lock but the moment i because i was a fresh i used to ask i want some borol in the approach and the kind of uh, you know looks i used to get from people and the comments you know mm. like you know approach me kya chahiye aapko borol take the abutment borol you know it is very close it's fine if you have uniform strata but if you are having some variation i think uh, there is a need to look a geotechnical uh, investigation from a different point of view like you may invest 5 to 10% but you may save more amount in your superstructure so i think at least in a approach of uh, flyovers or maybe wherever you are constructing if you are having a good investigation can give you a really good insight because i have i have seen a uh, couple of cases during working that uh, you know sometimes the investigation was not sufficient or not being properly looked finally the ground improvement was not being carried out so there were issues so i think sufficient soil investigation is being ma made mandatory we can have mitigate a uh, lot of issues this could be a, you know one of the point another part is the planning part you know we have a, a project whatever is the project let's say railway or road it has to start from x chain to y chain in that there are number of things to be taken care of like bridge could be pavement embankment reinforced soil so many things what i have observed is Uh, you know bridges get some priority but when it comes to earthwork okay earthwork is very simple they start but when it comes to reinforced soil the priority is not being put that way i think it has to parallelly start with the bridge you know the, the way you plan because imagine it's a 10 meter high wall with 200 mm compacted thickness that means 1 meter you need five five layers to be done 10 meters is 50 layers one layer how many days you will take typically if you have good backfill good progress funds are available there is no issue of funds then typically you could do in 1 meter uh, wall to be achieved typically let's say around 15 16 days three layers in a day i am taking very you know uh, i was a luxurious time compaction checking everything but that timing is missed because i have seen we have bridge ready when the reinforced soil will get ready i want in two months where you have height to be at 12 12 meters so i need not to explain what will happen at site you know so planning is very important part if we correct that i think lot of the things will be taken care of 
a very important aspect i think this is a crux of this is the skill the skill of the manpower now skill of manpower you know we can have a, a graduate coming from a university and if we put it in a soil with a lot of responsibilities he may perform to his own understanding and whatever knowledge he has gained but if that guy is exposed to this technology let's say 4 5 years or 10 years he will perform it differently so how do we address this issue i think we have to do a lot of work in the country important part is ensuring the skill manpower at site it doesn't mean that you don't give a, a chance to a fresh people or don't give a chance to a fresh organization i think there has to be a some mechanism to work out when you have a fresh agencies doing some work they must tie up with the experience agency and do this if we do that because what happens you know uh, some people working in the organizations uh, like us and after some time they think of entrepreneurship so if so one person has gained experience he start some organization where he will have a lot of fresh people so with the one person experience he is trying to drive this whole technology there it's a i would say first four or five years is a very critical if the guy is sensible having the good judgment everything is fine but if something is not clear on this part he just focuses on let's say more on technical or more on commercial or more on execution there is a problem it has to be all 360 degrees has to be seen so my way forward would be you know for this technology though it's not rocket science but let me tell you it's a mix of different engineering involved in that neither is only structural engineer can do it neither only geotechnical engineer can do it. it is a mix of things so here experience has to be mandated so that we don't have failures in future we demand a certified system so that we don't have failures because the certifications will assure you okay this is being tested secondly you demand the experience the similar technology what i mean by similar technology is the kind of fascia the kind of reinforcement the kind of connection provide some experience that this technology has to don't don't go by doing r and d on a real project where you develop some connection on the project itself you develop some types of fascia no i think that has to be taken care maybe maybe after a decade we can look into this kind of options to do this so i think there is a need to look uh, from that aspect now as far as standards i think standards are good enough if someone just follows that ircsp 102 mots 31 obs i think you get very good structure and i have personally seen such kind of structures built uh, i work with very good contractors they are very quality conscious they even demand the people has to be there from start to end and the structures are very good so i think it's a completely a team effort of enfor soil wall agency consultant who is checking and approving the agency implementing and most important part there has to be a experienced site people at site then you are being taken care of everything thank you thank you thank you uh, dr mahajan uh, i think you have very broadly covered holistically almost all aspects which uh, sort of our reasons for uh, the uh, failures and the remedies also uh, one thing i just wanted to also share with you all that uh, you know one of the uh, one of the problem that i faced uh, in many of the projects is that the initial investigation is very scanty based on which the dpr is prepared based on which the tender documents are prepared in one of the case i found that there was a, a major component was ari wall in this, in that project where uh, during the uh, once the apc contractor comes on board and of course when he bids also he he doesn't invest that much of money in geotechnical investigation prior to bidding but after that uh, he, once the geotechnical investigation was done they found that in many of the ari wall uh, you know areas there was a huge huge problem of uh, 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 requiring ground improvement i mean there were problems of liquefaction there were problems of poor soil there were problems of filled up soil which completely changed the cost uh, or the cost of ari wall and it is it was in effects and now most of our epc contracts the risk is completely tilted towards uh, you know uh, the contractor it is not a balanced contract uh, and that is one more problem why uh, the 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 the, the uh, solutions are uh, because of the financial reasons 
there is there is a always an a tendency by the epc contractor and his uh, colleagues to come out with a solution which may not be necessarily safe anyway moving forward i think uh, we would now i would request uh, mr atanu adhikari from reinforced earth to kindly share his views he is also a person whom i know since his childhood i think about 20 25 years back uh, when we did a project in kurali i remember uh, at those those days the arival used to be very rarely done you know initial period and i remember right. atanu doing the design so atanu uh, your your views thank you sir uh, and very good evening uh, i hope i am audible yeah yeah you are yes uh, thank you so much you are audible so, yeah <laughs> uh, respected uh, professor uh, shiv kumar babu sir uh, alok bhumi ji uh, i hope uh, pandey sir is still there i hope he will be listening to me and my colleagues uh, 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 sri Raj, uh, rajiv ahuja ji i think you have almost addressed all the points <laughs> i uh, i just uh, uh, want to start with uh, the way i see uh, the problem and the way i see Uh, you know, coming to the subjects, which is the failure of uh, Arival. Uh, I see. I want to uh, uh, place in two uh, different parts, um, uh, two different problems. Uh, the first part of the problem is the stress, distress in the wall, and the second part of the problem is the failure. Uh, I want to start with uh, this uh, uh, two distinct uh, way of looking these two problems separately. why i will i will explain in uh, in my uh, in my explanation uh, in, in as i go forward uh, when i say distress in a wall i mean it is directly proportional to the quality that means if the quality is not followed we i i don't have to explain why there will be a stress in the wall you can expect there will be a stress how do i define uh, failure is a different way i think when a structure fails it is not because of only quality it cannot happen i am 200% convinced that we cannot keep only blaming uh, the quality for the failures we have to accept that a failure can only happen when there is a fault in the either design or there is a fault in the system so this is how i look uh, these two uh, separately now coming to uh, how we can address i think uh, most of the points uh, has been uh, covered but i want to i want to see how we are progressing in the country uh, you know since the first structure was built i remember when the first structure built in uh, way back in 1995 you know what was the responsibility of of uh, of the uh, people like the manufacturer or system provider or whatever you call the responsibility at that point of time was actually everything in fact in the first project if i remember we have casted the panel in delhi and transported in jammu so that was the level of responsibility that was there eventually what happened is eventually you know things grow the market started expanding and uh, you know the, because of the scale there is a change of the model now what happened eventually is that this execution and design engineering has been separated so the execution is looking after by the contractor mostly and the design engineering supplied by the uh, uh, manufacturer that was uh, a quite successful uh, i would say uh, model of business and uh, i think we executed and even executing today uh, with this model very successful but what has happened eventually further is that it has gone to a level where you know tomorrow i can go out of this company and start doing the design and i can be a designer and this is a allowed system so i think we we have diluted uh, the controlling mechanism um, of uh, of the entire uh, business model so coming to what are the remedies uh, i have i have only 10 uh, 10 points uh, i will i will discuss uh, one by one so i will discuss first the quality issues the quality issues as i mentioned uh, the responsibility must lie with one organization cannot allow and this policy level decision has to be taken if you we we say that x company is designing and x company is doing the construction and the some company is doing the supply 
uh, this way it, it is only going to dilute uh, the entire process and this is what is in practice today let's accept it so the responsibility of the entire system as i think uh, 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 alok bhumi ji has also mentioned the same thing wanted to explain that uh, you know it should lie with a single agency uh, this is my first point to uh, improve the quality second point from our perspective what are the difficulty uh, that we are facing um, uh, how how the uh, the entire system works uh, let us try to understand uh, the contractor gives the award uh, to uh, the manufacturer or the uh, company like us uh, to execute the work so we do the design we supply the drawing and the work is executed as per our construction method statement and we have a engineer at the site to look up the quality now this engineer and the contractor who given us the award we work together and we try to actually execute the work and follow the quality procedure most of the cases it works out but in some cases it doesn't work so let's see where is the client and consultant when we are saying that there is certain fault and certain quality measures are not followed there is no where the consultant and the client is involved so how do as a as a system provider as a manufacturer how can i control and who is there to listen to me there is no one if the contractor wish he will follow if he doesn't wish he will not follow so i think we need to develop a system or a mechanism by which we should be made respond i mean authorized we should must be given some kind of authorization but the 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 uh, you know either in rfi like i i'm saying uh, an example we are doing a project in in southeast asia a very complex uh, tall structure and there the system is that in a rfi the, my engineer will sign in each of their documents until that signature is done that the, the work has been done as per the method statement as per the quality program you know described or by us uh, then the uh, contractor will get paid for the items this is a system it is and it is working uh, but this is just an example uh, i don't know what is the answer but i think we need to answer this uh, problem otherwise uh, it will be at the mercy of you know or or whatever uh, you know the decision maker uh, will will do whatever they want so that's my second point uh, third point uh, i want to stress uh, uh, upon is the uh, you know repair activity i think uh, what is happening uh, when we are doing construction uh, during the construction stage only we know that there are some movements the panel alignment is not correct and by all means we cannot stop it the contractor go ahead with the construction the construction is done and the panel is out i think we need to stop it during the construction stage only we must give certain tolerance limits if the wall is within not that tolerance the wall must be dismantled and redo if we allow then this process of quality and but doing soil nailing uh, after completion of the structure this will continue this will never end and we will never able to achieve a good quality structure if we want to wish do that this is the only way this is my third point uh, fourth Uh, i think we need to uh, prepare a list of do's and don'ts uh, i think all has been discussed uh, this topic can be summarized and we can prepare a do's and don'ts so that's my uh, four point related to quality issues uh, when i come to failure uh, of course the statistics is correct uh, dr ratnakar has already mentioned connection most of the i think 80% is connection uh, if i'm not correct so the connection system has to be tested and i think uh, i fully agree and it must be tested properly and then it must then only this kind of connection system shall be used my only addition is to that is that in india there is no in fact i don't know if internationally also there is any guideline available how to do a connection test in a panel i think we should form a guideline uh, for testing the connection system uh, this is very important uh, second related to the failure is i think uh, robust design uh, if we don't have a very good design uh, then uh, there will be risk and design means everything detailing drainage system foundation stability global stability geotechnical whatever we have talked there has to be robust design then only we can prevent failures third point is the system what system we are adopting like dr atnagar mentioned that there are certain organization who certify the system 
So when you are using a certified system, you can be as a client, as a consultant, you can be more confident that yes, there is a third body, independent body who has certified the system. So I think this, uh, this can be a good uh, way also to allow uh, uh, different systems. Uh, fourth, uh, there must be some kind of uh, certification eligibility criteria, uh, which should be uh, written down. Uh, tomorrow, I should not go and start uh, selling and say that I am a designer and I can do a RUL. Uh, that should not happen. Uh, then, uh, fifth, most important is detailing. A lot, lot improvement is required in terms of drawing and detailing. So these are my five uh, points uh, which I want to propose uh, for improvements. Uh, last uh, but not the least, I think uh, if I am not correct, statistically, India, we are building maximum number of, in terms of volume, I think we are probably number one. I don't know in, uh, how many lakhs square meter of structure we are building, and it is increasing. Unfortunately, we have not done a single instrumentation of a wall. I think it's very, very unfortunate. I mean, uh, to instrument the wall, uh, the kind of money that we're spending in building this structure, if I compare, it is not even 0.00001%. Then why can't uh, we just do some instrumentation of a wall and we validate? Because, uh, you know, the wall that are designed and the way constructed in uh, Europe and USA, we know in India it is never, it will never be same. It's not possible that we expect that everything will be perfect. Even if we follow everything, it will be never be perfect. So I think uh, one uh, submission that we should come up is uh, how we can instrument few walls and see uh, what the real uh, loads are. Are we, are we in the line as uh, done in other countries or we are a little on the higher side? So these are my uh, uh, submissions. Uh, I hope uh, this will be helpful. Uh, I, I love to con congratulate uh, uh, you know, the, the Indian Association of Structure Engineer for taking up this initiative. It was much needed. Um, for the industry, it was much needed. And I want to thank you, Professor uh, Shiv Kumar Babu and uh, uh, Mixer for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adonio. I think you have done a marvelous job. Uh, uh, almost you have done my job of summing up the, the entire you know, uh, uh, gist of what we discussed over the last two, two hours. So, uh, uh, actually, we are already, uh, you know, five minutes past six o'clock, which was the time. So, we have very little time now really to uh, take the question Q&A. And I can see there are a lot of hands also raised who wants to speak. So, Professor Babu, uh, how do you want to take up the Q&A? Would you like to answer? Uh, maybe we can pass it on to you. Yeah, uh, yeah. You want me to go right from the beginning, like, or you, you can know. pick up pick up uh, four or five questions which you okay. like. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I answer. mean, I don't so think that... I have a choice because see, what kind of geotechnical instrumentation can be done? Will it be useful for avoiding disasters? It's a beautiful question. I think it needs, you know, every patient needs instrumentation, right? So we need that some level of minimum instrumentation. Uh, because when so much money is being spent and you want to get the benefit out of the technique. We need to do it, uh, definitely a good design followed by good instrumentation it is required. Uh, and then, uh, so somebody says, Vijay Kumar, he says that he's not able to find a suitable backfill material in India. I mean, I think, see, it is not a problem at all. It is just that the way you understand the backfill, you know, you, you know, we have, it is, it's soil is uh, say very complicated, you know, you understand a person. So you have to understand it properly, whether it is, you know, so here is a soil structure interaction problem and even a drainage, you know, hydraulics. So you have to understand it properly. It's an excellent system provided you understand whether it is, a, I mean, backfill material, uh, I, yeah, backfill materials, you know, the, whatever is specified, they're reasonably okay. Even we should be able to use marginal materials. You know, you, you don't want, you know, so then be successful. That should be the way to take forward. I mean, I'm sure that uh, we have enough knowledge in the country, but we should do it. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, small contractors are doing without knowledge and all that. Of course, that's what we are. They're all our own brothers. We should just uh, bring them to the mainstream, guide them. I think, uh, you know, this uh, poor quality has to be really improved. That is our own uh, issue. Of course, there is a question by Jolendra Kumar about uh, 
crash barrier, precursor, in situ, whatever, you know, that code is silent on the provision. I'm not sure how, it should be okay, right? I mean, whatever, I think our look can answer it. But um, yeah, uh, are you all failures during earthquake? Yeah, there are many things, but the record very clearly shows that they perform much better during earthquake because of the flexible nature of the Arival system itself. Uh, there is a, it's a, because Japan is, has adapted, uh, you know, in a big way. And um, so the uh, good connection, okay. So I think we have discussed enough on that. What is stain compatibility? This is the biggest problem, I think, you know, in my opinion, we don't understand. Uh, it, so all the geotechnical designs are deformation based, whereas structural designs are based on stress based. This understanding has to be there. You know, like you, you can't do a stress based design in geotechnical engineering. Absolutely, like you know, you may say bearing capacity, you will get. You can't accept that forty five, but you should go for deformation, right? So my request is, you strike a balance between uh, you know understanding the stresses and strains. We understand. Otherwise, you'll get a lot of strains. It's dangerous. So we have water. If you don't have, ha, ha, we don't want poor poor water pressures. Otherwise, we'll have blood pressure. Okay, it's like that. You know, I always say that if you have uh, poor water pressure, it is similar to our BP. So let us reduce all that. So, okay, ground improvement, yes, it's required. Now, how can you handle soft soils like marine clay and all that? I think uh, there is no substitute without ground improvement techniques. If the soil, you see, the thing is, whatever is the design that we are uh, doing in our, any of the courts, they assume a competent foundation. So absolutely, there is no, there is a very, very important point. And uh, so it should be an integrated design. I cannot uh, say ground, it should be, you know, ground improved ground plus uh, are you all, you know, you have to check it uh, properly. Then what is the impact of water uh, for effectiveness of soil needs with short creek and okay, this is not a, an issue uh, because uh, they, they, you know, in the side, they still work, but it, efficiency may be a little less, but see, that's what we should do in effectiveness design. Yeah, joint defect is okay, pre-stressing, can pieces with the medium, I am not sure about it. Um, now, facing vinyl swelled. Okay, it's not a thing, the, the movement, I think, what he's referring. And uh, uh, so interface between soil and rock issue. This is a very important point. Actually, I have seen a lot of landslides also because there, so we have to understand those things and uh, make a proper connection, you know, like uh, proper understanding, but at least where uh, it's, it matters. Uh, we have to really look at it. That's what we saw in the case of uh, a good design was done in uh, that uh, fourth uh, case study I showed, you know, for that four tied wall. I, I looked at it and it was done, I think, verified by some international consultants. If I remember, I don't, I don't remember, but it was done very well. I was looking at all those numbers. My good friend, Professor Yoshi from Japan, I just uh, sent him a last minute uh, email because he's an expert, a top, a top, one of the top guys in forensic geotechnic. Professor Yoshi is here. So, uh, yeah, I think he just made a comment, of course, uh, some about drainage, uh, it's okay. Uh, then uh, what is, uh, yeah, uh, when you said that one of the cause of failures, the heavy rains means the design of MSA not considered. Yes, actually the thing is that we should have proper uh, monsoon management system. It's not like, you know, we can't really uh, go to, uh, it is not easy. So we should be able to handle those things uh, properly or uh, guidelines should be proper. So yes, yeah, seepage is something that uh, is very tricky. So we have to have drainage properly. Uh, yeah, what is chimney chain? That what will happen? Yeah, it will lead to problems. Definitely one can do analysis. Even the chain, the problem that I always find is uh, what should be the diameter of the chimney? Chain? Nothing is specified. You provide 200 mm, something, they say, but there is no matter. So, but then now we have adequate knowledge on how do you understand the modeling of water also. So it can be done. It's not a problem. Um, Oh, this problem, I think Indrajit Ghai, he keeps on asking about rodents and mice in Ari walls. I think I get this problem. So, of course, this is, <laughs> I keep getting this. Uh, I, uh, um, they, in Punjab, whenever I go to Ari wall presentation, they will ask this question. I don't know why. I never saw this question anywhere in the country. <laughs> so, I, I find uh, maybe we should have be uh, some other measures, not technical measures you can take. And... Uh, uh, so, so, yeah, ground improvement, some, some points illustrated Dr. S.K. Dhawan. I think they can I'll be addressed. It is all geotechnical. Yeah, guidelines on the use of geocomposite, it's very, very important because we have to sort out this issue like equivalency and also the understanding of how to design a geocomposite 
under various conditions and how do they replace the like you know i know the gradation the way somebody was mentioning they just dump uh, drainage material in the corner they just don't care what type of drainage material it is does it follow anything you know i i that's what i get the inputs uh, so this is something that i see then um, where i am yeah geocomposite i i don't know why it is suddenly gone uh because there is no numbering system here kaksha yeah yeah so i would like to answer if you don't mind because it's my responsibility if you don't mind yeah sure sure um, um see nowadays a lot of falls are being designed with uh, uh, slope surcharge yeah there are a lot of procedures available uh, for this there's no issue durability ensured yes there are also methods to do that uh, what is your opinion about anchoring the gs to prevent slippage yeah it is a good thing and um, no yeah everything is a matter of design and detailing and understanding that not, nothing is everything is solvable um yeah monitor the function of fari wall we have a lot of instrumentation like essentially stresses and strains for what pressures something we have to see oh then there is some uh, pavan kumar if there yeah i think there are a lot of questions here he can be asked he can contact me later if uh, uh, you know at a more specific uh, question and uh, yeah there always ex- practical compaction deficiency in 1.5 meters uh, yeah so um, yeah um, yeah this is also like you know we should be very careful in uh, ensuring proper density there it's a more a matter of construction and how to ensure it uh, federal highway pull out resistance alpha uh, alpha this is a more interaction parameter if uh, they can discuss with me any of them they are per- per- personally happy to discuss because our responsibility is if the field engineers are educated <coughs> we are we have we have been very happy we have seen that a good field engineer does lot of miracles than anybody else so uh depending on okay ex- can expert committee develop re construction guidance based on indian condition hope so we will do something i mean i hope Uh, until unless we have good guidelines we may not be able to con- create good work no 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 don't stop that so uh, my suggest is uh, the uh, like as uh, alok said it's out more of a good intention any work is out of good intention good practice then looking for guidelines uh, you know guidelines even if they are there we can always mislead misunderstand so so it's more out of good work ethics so uh, generally design uh, will be okay yeah this is some more about design but it can be uh, discussed it's i think they can call me uh, uh, quality depends on proper understanding and knowledge of the technology there is no value for engineering you know, no 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 this is see this where our see the fact that uh, this seminar was in, uh, presented and introduced and there is an active participation of nearly 450 people show the it shows the importance of the subject and the interest that we have um, so yeah people are talking about manuals uh, is it possible for arival should include testing cost of soil strata it's i think EP, that i think somebody should answer that you know more out of contracting arrangements yeah i think more so a lot of my good friends are there uh, thanking and nice yeah stability analysis and yeah i think they can call me i mean i don't have yeah. any view yeah. on that so uh, i think so there is one be, question uh, uh, professor babu yeah. Yeah. many people are raising one question whether the handouts mm-hmm. will be given or not so i would request you if you can uh, give us the handouts that can be circulated to all okay. the participants okay, okay. and um, all these questions uh, we will uh, we will also email to you and yeah. uh, if there are some specific pointed question maybe you can answer uh, uh, sure sure us, yeah sure sure so we uh, before i i close the session uh, if mr rk pandey is there i would like to get his views because he he represents our client and uh, you know i think if lot of lot of issues if we would like to hear from mr arke pande if he is there uh, he is fi- after he is listening to all of us what are his views pande sahab aap hain kya i have a lot of questions my friend my from my good friend a a v mandal ah, every seminar mandal. 
yeah i know he's a good friend of mine he can yeah yeah he's a very him. enthusiastic and i know him very well yeah so, and uh, also most of them i know he has okay. i had to write an exam here some six or seven questions <laughs> okay. so yeah. i think uh, mr rk pande probably is not there so anyway i think we had a wonderful wonderful uh, uh, webinar on this uh, issue of failure of reinforced walls we have uh, we have got not only an excellent presentation by professor babu but thereafter the panelists views were all uh, excellent and i would request all the panelists if you can kindly jot down whatever you mentioned and uh, email to yes. us then we would probably with uh, proceeding with professor babu we would like to uh, you know conclude and finalize the summary and recommendations of uh, this webinar so that we can take it forward and uh, in my uh, view we should maybe uh, form a core uh, core team to come out with an improvement of the existing guideline or maybe uh, an additional guideline in terms of how to do the remedy in case so, you know we find some uh, unserviceable ari wall or some failures how to address the failure is also an issue so i think maybe an upgradation of the existing guideline or maybe a kind of a guidance note uh, if we can prepare uh, professor babu under your um, leadership if we can form a small core team we would like to do that and come out with uh, some kind of a guidance note which uh, and also some improvement on the uh, existing irc sp102 that would be great so yeah. with, with this uh, i would like to uh, close the session uh before that i would like to profusely thank professor uh, shiva kumar babu for accepting our invitation and giving such an excellent presentation and also to all our panelists and participants for making it really lively thank you all uh, mr Man mittal if you want to uh, sort of close the session you are on mute manoj Uh, i would like to just thank you you know before i just uh, you know uh, must thank you uh, for the giving an opportunity because this is one thing that was always bothering of course even the roads road design in the country i'll tell you uh, i think we have very casual i told many of our experts including rk pandey you know mm -hmm. we don't uh, the, even the testing you know you are going for national highway 6 lane the cost of construction is so much so many crores yeah, yeah. but for instrumentation testing and understanding like yeah. you know we are not spending anything and uh, you know absolutely the kind of uh, infrastructure we have is world class we are trying to aim for that but the quality of design quality of uh, even the analysis itself it's not there in the in in trying to follow some norms we are blindly following some norms which need not be like i think they need to because uh, you know there are a lot of uh, questions that we need to have answers so uh, i would like to thank you for giving me an opportunity i, I have a lot of my friends here and whom i could not individually answer in my in this chat and uh, they're welcome to talk to me and uh, you know th th thank you very much yeah thank you oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, really uh, it was a very uh, fascinating uh, presentation and panel discussion actually this is not my area i i do not work in this field uh, but uh, i thought i will just uh, welcome everybody and i will introduce the moderator and then probably i will go but uh, but it was very interesting uh, uh, presentation so i listened to almost two hours now more than two hours it was really a very nice presentation thank you uh, uh, dr uh, professor babu and all the panelists i think we covered all theoretical aspects uh, uh, construction details aspects and also Uh, the the uh, the execution and uh, implementation issues also but now i am convinced uh, although it is not my field but i am convinced that uh, number one we should have a uh, really good implementable uh, guideline on this so that uh, number one number two uh, uh, not only for this thing but also uh, for other uh, failures there must be some kind of a system where uh, where where responsibility should be fixed who is responsible for which thing and ultimately it is not only the consultant or these are these are the person who are really designing and doing thing but i do not know what is the role of the the role of the authority or the the the, the client organization or the engineer or the of the client 
uh, who is ultimately approving the things uh, what is the responsibility of them because in case of any failure what they do they will take the action against the contractor against the consultant and all those things but ultimately what is the responsibility of the client because ultimately they are the persons who are uh, making the contracts they are uh, they are they are ultimately appointing everyone and they are doing everything so their responsibility should also be fixed in case of a failure and there should be a proper system of uh, uh, failure investigation report should also be made public uh, we should learn the lessons i don't think we are learning any lessons from failures most of the time investigations are not doing uh, properly nobody is being punished properly actually what is this is an eye wash which is which is happening so uh, this is not only for to this field this is for uh, for, for all kinds of failures buildings all kinds of failures so i think we need to work on it alok i really thankful to you you are a chairman of this committee who is organizing these kind of events and really you are picking very good subjects and you are contacting very good speakers and panelists you are doing very wonderful job uh, thankful i'm thankful to you and thanks to everyone who participated in this webinar and all the participants who joined just i want to inform uh, we have one more event uh, on 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 10th of july uh, it is a uh, award ceremony actually last year i instructi instituted uh, some awards in different categories and uh, this 10th july we are facilitating those uh, winners and on this uh, event we will also be felicitating dr sudhir jain who is the director iit gandhinagar uh, he got the padam shri also last year and he also he is also founder uh, member of the istrakti so uh, we will be felicitating him also on 10th july at 5 pm and there will be a, a technical presentation by sudhir jain also so i will request everyone to join on this event also thank you thank you everyone thank, thank you. you manoj Thank you. 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 Thank you.